Keith Blanchard is the Chief Professional Officer of the Boys and Girls Clubs of Alachua County. He also provides service to clubs around the country as a field consultant. His expertise includes fundraising, operations management, marketing, board relationships, and development. Before coming to Alachua County, Keith was a police officer in Salinas, California. He was also the executive director of the Police Activities League, or PAL. In that role, his duties included volunteer recruitment, athletic and social event planning, athletic league development, and fundraising. Prior to his work in law enforcement, Keith was the vice president and general manager of the Salinas Peppers, a double-A professional baseball team. Before that, he and his wife Vera lived in Rio de Janeiro for nine years, where he worked as an artist, owned an art gallery, was a tennis pro, and worked with underprivileged children. Keith has a Bachelor of Arts degree from Southwest Texas State University. He is the recipient of multiple local, state, and national awards, including many Boys and Girls Club National Honors Awards. He serves on numerous boards, including Department of Juvenile Justice Boards, the University of Florida Performing Arts Board, and many others. Welcome, Keith. Thank you for having me. I'm trying to remember the last time I had a tennis pro artist gallery owner, police officer, uh, and baseball team manager on the show, and I, th I think I'm breaking new ground here. I'm really, really old. <laughs> That's right. Many lives. Yeah, you have to be about 250 to have done all this. Well, I'm so happy to have you here. Um, you know, I, like most people, I'm very aware of uh, boys and girls clubs and how important they are, but uh, I was pleased to have a reason to kind of look into it in a little more detail, and the, the history of the organization is just fascinating. So can we begin with kind of that moment in history where, where this whole idea got going? Of Boys and Girls Clubs of America? Yeah. 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 Um, it really kind of started in, in the Northeast um, around the time when in the coal, in the coal mines, and the, 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 um, what the, the plan was actually there's a bunch of women that were having problems with the coal workers not coming home straight home after work. <laughs> they tended to go to bars and so forth after work. So their idea was this group of women got together and they decided we're going to make cookies and have milk and wholesome activities, checkers and cards for the adults. And they opened the doors and they invited them in and the men just went straight by. Well, that didn't work, but it, during that time they used a lot of children. They called them clinker boys. And the boys were in these in these mines, actually picking up the hot coals that fell on the floor. That's thus the name Clinker. Oh. So they decided, well, these kids were starting to get into some unwholesome activities as well. So they tried it with them, and it worked. And they lured the kids in, and they offered them cookies, and they played games. And that's kind of how the whole thing started. And it just kind of grew from there. And wh when was this? This like was the this is uh, over a hundred years ago. Yeah, really? we've been around. I think we had our hundredth anniversary about six years ago. So about 106, 107 years ago. Interesting. And then how did it start to kind of coalesce and grow? It just gradually time? grew around the country to the point that, that now, um, currently, we have over 4,000 organizations nationwide. Really? Um, every military base overseas has a Boys and Girls Club, it's, it's, it's mandated. Um, there's o we have over four million kids nationwide, so it just kind of grew, um, and it's continuing to grow at an, it really is a surprising rate around the country. And when did, uh, when did the Boys and Girls Club kind of get a foothold in Alachua County? Um, the, the original club was on Waldo Road. Um, we were formed in 1949, so we actually predate a lot of other, like the United Way, we were one of the first three or four United Way agencies back in the day. Mm -hmm. um, that, that club since closed and they um, relocated and built the, the one in Lincoln Estates, the Southeast Boys and Girls Club, which is now where we house the Mentor Center. Mm -hmm. And then the, almost at the same time they, they purchased the land in, in Northwest Gainesville where, where we have a club to this day. So those those sprang up in the around the, in the early 50s, mm -hmm. um, and have been gone through many different remodeling stages and changes over the years. But we've been around since since the early 1950s. There was a time when it was just the boys' club. Right. When did it become the boys and girls? Club? That's a long story, but basically, yeah. it, it, there, there was the there was an organization called Girls Club back in the 80s. Um, they ended up buying them out to be able to come Boys and Girls Club, and that organization actually came Girls Inc., um, okay. which exists 
to this day. So uh -huh. s since the early 80s. What, was it originally a, a boys only club and then it kind of transitioned? I think uh, by name and, and primarily boys, but I think um, it, from talking to other directors around the country, um, there always were some girls and it became more and more and more. Uh -huh. um, in fact, the fir I know the first girl that became a member in Alachua County and she actually became an employee later on. Oh, is that um, right? But w when, I, when I arrived, um, it was about 70, 30. Uh -huh. And it's now almost 50-50. If you, if you take out football, it is 50. I, I was looking at the national mm -hmm. numbers on the club, and, and you're right. It's almost yeah. right at, I think it's maybe 47, yeah. 53 yeah. or something. What, uh, <coughs> how has it evolved in Alachua County? I mean, what, what was offered back mm -hmm. when it first started versus kind of how it has evolved? And, I know it's much larger now, but uh, how, what kind of changes have happened? That's over a good the years? question because that's probably one of the things that we struggle with the most to this day. Um, for years, we were we were the primary, well, really the only organization that offered a lot of different athletic programs. Mm -hmm. If you talk to old timers, if you, if you played baseball or you played football, you played for the Boys and Girls Club. I've seen pictures of people lined up around the block to sign up to play baseball because there weren't any other alternatives. Right. Um, today, we still run the largest boys and girls club run football program in the country, but our focus has shifted from athletics to other things, just primarily academics and tutoring. Alachua County is the largest in yeah. the country? Yeah, we, we went to a, um, we had an NFL grant a few years ago, and we got to send our director to Denver, Colorado, to a, to a training for these NFL programs. And there was a, several other boys and girls clubs there, and we learned at that at that meeting that we were one of the largest, if not the largest, um, in the country. So it's it, it's continued to grow every year. Um, it's pretty it's pretty expansive. It's impressive how many kids we play in that program. Are, are, are these like connections you had back from your professional baseball days? Or <laughs> no, I think it's just you know Gainesville's Gainesville, and the tide of the Gators, and the tide of the university, yeah. and all the alumni that have come through our program. I mean, every day I learn of more people. That, that played for us when they were kids. And then their, you know, their kids are playing, like Coach Muschamp played here when he was a kid. I've got his team photo. Both of his sons played this year. You know, Doug Johnson grew up at the club, played baseball and football. So right. there's, there's so many, just that long history and that tradition. And that, that's a blessing and a curse because when you ask a lot of people what they know about us, typically it's, oh, I know you guys have a huge football program. I drive by there all the time and see it. Right. But they don't know about a lot of the other things that we do. So, so what is the the overall objective or mission statement, or it, do you have it in a concise statement? Or? Well, it's changed over time. Um, you know, part of it was was outcome driven. Part of it was grant driven. Um, you know, it, it by necessity. If it, for example, you can't even apply for a lot of grants anymore if you're not providing academic assistance. But luckily for us, we already did that. It just right. we just pushed it to the forefront. Right. So we, we really, about four years ago, we started shifting and really simplifying what we say we do and what we do and how, and how we report it and how we prove it, mm -hmm. the three things. And the primary one is academic success, and then there's character and life skills, and then there's healthy lifestyles. Mm -hmm. So those are our three pillars that we, that we build everything around. Now, there's multiple programs that fall under each of those because right. um, not every child learns the same way. So there's technology programs and education. There's nutrition programs and the Healthy Lifestyles program, and that's where we get in the recreation. Um, but I think the one people always ask me, you know, the secret to our success and, and how we're able to accomplish what we accomplish, and mm -hmm. I think it really is just one word. We make it fun. Right. Um, and that's, that's the challenge, to be able to take all these different things that we do. Because the kids have been in school all day long. They don't want to go to school again. Right. So we, we take we have some objectives that maybe they don't even realize what we're trying to accomplish. We're right. trying to teach them certain things, but we have to make it fun or they won't want to come. When I was reading the research that you provided, one thing that became very clear was that you were very proud of your staff and, and their training and their competence. Uh, how, how large a, a staff do you have? It fluctuates in the school year and the summer. In the summer, we have to hire up for summer camp and things mm -hmm. like that. But we typically average around 25 to 30 um, staff members. And Boys Club is a national organization, so what is the, what is the advantage or how, how does that affiliation work? 
It's a huge advantage. Um, we have access to, to a lot of different things that smaller organizations don't have. And that's one of the reasons why at the Mentor Center we were asked to kind of help other organizations with things like training. And um, w for example, you can take college credit online through, through Boys and Girls Club of America. They have everything from how to open a club, how to build a facility, how to furnish it, you know, what color schemes, all of that are on, on the website. And then you have things like risk management training, um, grant samples, fundraising bank is on there. there it, is a, it is a complicated, <laughs> convoluted website, to right. be honest with you, because there's right. just so much information. But it's something that, without it, um, the value that it brings us is incredible. As a former nonprofit manager myself, uh, one thing that I was always interested in was the chronicle of philanthropy. Mm -hmm. And I, I did a little research on it, and I did not know that Boys and Girls Clubs was the, based on their ranking, was the number one organization for youth in the United States. Uh, I'm sure you're proud of that. Yeah. Um, I, I, I heard, I've heard of the formula for impact. Mm -hmm. can, you, can you tell me about that? Well, that's exactly what I brought. That's the, the academic success, the good character okay. and citizenship, and okay. the healthy lifestyle. That's and the formula we just That's the formula about. for impact. And okay. it's, it's, really, it's, it's really boiled down to, simple, to make it as simple as possible. We, I think I used to talk about what we do, and it would people just couldn't get their mind around it because it was just so many things. Mm -hmm. we, at one point, we were running like 36 different programs, and we would try to explain each one. And so now we just kind of, look, these are the three things that we do, and, and everything else kind of falls within this umbrella. Mm -hmm. And it makes it a lot easier to report on. That's another advantage of the national organization. Every day, all of our kids enter into a system called Kid Tracks. Mm -hmm. And all the data gets uploaded to national. So we can re produce reports of, you know, how many kids attended that day, what time they got here, what time they left, what programs they're in, their GPAs, all of that goes in there. And then they can produce reports for us, or we can produce our own reports. So it's outcome yes, kind of based. Yes, very, very outcome based. Yeah, yeah. Now, uh, what, I, I, this is fascinating. Now you make me want to dig into the website <laughs> a little bit more and, and get some reports. Um, <coughs> Tell me about the Florida Tax Watch study that was done. Um, that's something that we, we're, all the Boys and Girls Clubs in Florida are a member of what's called the Florida Alliance. Mm -hmm. um, and we decided several years ago, I think about six or seven years ago, that we, we needed some additional proof um, to show donors and funders that what we do works. Mm -hmm. And also to show, you know, that I, I look at it like there's two types of donors in the world out there. There's the ones that you can reach with heartstrings, you know, with, with stories about kids and, mm -hmm. and what they've accomplished. And then there's the, the finance-minded people who they want to know how much, you know, what does my dollar give me and how much does it save the taxpayer? Yeah. Well, that's what the Florida Tax Watch study does, is it looks at the cost per child, what does it cost, and, and how much money does that save the taxpayer? So we started this going down this road about six or seven years ago, and we just we just published the third phase of the study, mm -hmm. and the results every time have been impressive. But this last time, we really asked asked them to look a little more in depth into things like teenage pregnancies, um, incarceration rates, and things like that, mm -hmm. and those numbers were even more impressive. Um, so one of the things, like locally, I can tell you is we're funded through the Department of Juvenile Justice with a gr gang prevention grant. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the things that kind of fed into the tax watch study. To be even in that program, you have to meet certain risk factors, like one of your parents has to be on probation or parole. You have to be failing in two or more subjects in school. Um, there's there's f four, out of four out of five that you have to meet to even qualify to be in it. Mm -hmm. um, We've run, averaged about 70, 80 kids a year in that program. And, I, and in, since I've been here, and we've had this almost the entire time, we've never had a kid reoffend or get arrested in the program. And it's not just me saying that, because the, the way the program works is all of the children's data is entered into a system called JJIS, which is a juvenile justice database. Mm -hmm. And if they have any negative contact with law enforcement at all, I get an immediate email. And then I, they want to know what happened and why. So it's, those are the things that if you look at the type of situation that that child could have ended up in, and be, if he was incarcerated, what that costs the taxpayer as opposed to funding through the state for a program like DJK. I know our local delegation uh, 
Representative Perry and Watson and uh, Senator Bradley have been very supportive of your program in the past. Right. You had a pretty good funding year last year from TJJ, didn't you? Yeah, it was. A, we worked really, really hard on a statewide level, grassroots level. Um, a, there was a group of us, about seven or eight, that went up to Tallahassee on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. I almost felt like it was almost a waste of time for me because, like you said, I had such a great re uh, relationship with the three of them already, and I already knew they were supporters. But it really did, when I got up there, it really did make a difference actually coming in person and they really appreciated that and and it and it showed um, there were other areas that weren't as supportive in the beginning but over time just the you know the conversations in the halls in between meetings and in committee meetings people really started to see you know for example representative watson grew up at the at the boys and girls club the southeast boys and girls club and so he was there just the other day I mean, it, people really started to see the number of people that, that have ties either through their children, their grandchildren, or maybe themselves that went there. And to be honest, when, when the first numbers came out, they were much lower than what we had anticipated. And when the final number came out, it was quite a bit higher than what we'd even asked for. And that doesn't happen. No. <laughs> yeah. Usually happens just exactly. the opposite. That's exactly. right. Well, so you get this DJJ funding. I know you get uh, federal funding. Uh, is that primarily through the Community Develop Block Grant? We program get we get some federal funding through CDBG, yes, uh -huh. and then we also get some federal funding through Boys and Girls Clubs of America. Oh, okay. Yeah. So they do a national fundraising that then trickles down well, somewhat. Or? That's kind of the the misconception about Boys and Girls Clubs is people see the you know Denzel Washington and Jennifer Lopez and they think that the money comes down to us and, and that's not the case we we actually pay dues to be a member okay. um, and but what you do have is access to programming access to the website access right. to training opportunities access to, to to all kinds of things including grants so there are there's some federal grants through OJP um, that were there are available to us and there's smaller grants through foundations and things like that so it's the onus is on us to apply for them I but see. but um there's quite a bit of opportunity available through boys and girls clubs in there well looking at your background one of your strengths is clearly fundraising so i'm sure you take advantage of those grant programs yeah we we do our best we've gotten some really interesting ones in the last few years but um, we just got one from sony which was for a bunch of digital cameras and video oh, no. cameras and a big television and so the kids are doing their own production and editing and filming. and uh -huh. um, So there's a lot of little smaller opportunities like that, and then there's bigger ones for like the, another gang prevention program that we have through OJP. Don't take this the wrong way. I'm so happy to be interviewing you, <laughs> but is there any chance you could get Denzel Washington on the, on the program? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. We've been trying that one for a while. That's been <laughs> one of my big failures. <laughs> That's right. I did get an autographed book from him a few years ago, but that was about <laughs> as close as I got to getting him here. But, but what I'm hearing you say, though, is locally the best way to support the club is to give directly to your local yeah. club. And uh, you get some United Way funding yes. as well? Yes. Yeah. Um, I know you get some Alachua County Commission funding, right. too, through our Community Agency Partnership Program. Uh, can you tell me about the Education and Career Development Grant that yeah. you were awarded this yeah, year? Yeah, we run, we run that at three of our sites. Um, Again, the focus of it, the primary piece of it, is tutoring and, and educational assistance, academic assistance. So what we we have, the minute school's out, the first thing they do is is they burn off a little bit of energy, and then they break up into smaller groups um, and do their homework. And we get we help them. Our staff helps them with that. But we also have literally hundreds of volunteers that we use utilize every day, primarily from the University of Florida. Mm -hmm. who, who we match them up either in small groups or in some cases one-on-one -on -one if needed to help them with their homework and their schoolwork and some other projects that they have ongoing at school. Mm -hmm. And then with the, with the middle school and teens, um, we've really identified, especially with our gang prevention programs as well, the same thing, that when you interview these older kids and ask them during their intake, you know, what is it you really want? Mm -hmm. Most of them are looking for a job or want to, in near future to have a job. And then when you start questioning them and asking them about it, you realize they're not prepared. Right. And they don't re even realize it sometimes. So we start with that, you know, how do you dress for an interview? Mm -hmm. You know, how do you talk? How do you greet people? How do you look people in the eye when you're having a conversation? How do you write a resume? How do you do a job search? All those things. 
And then we really make that interesting. And then we do campus tours with them. Um, we take them out to a whole bunch of different um, employers that we have, uh, we have contracts with where they'll take them behind the scenes and show them, for example, at the mall with Banana Republic, they'll go in the back in the stock room and show them how it all works, the, you know, how the sales part works. Um, and so you, you put some reality to yeah, what can yeah. be vague for, for a young person. And we, like, for example, at one of our clubs last year, 100% of our seniors graduated from high school. And all of those seniors went to Eastside High School, and I, I probably don't have to tell you what the graduation rate was there. So, right. um, and last year also, 100% of those went on to college, and most of them were able to get some type of scholarship. So that's another piece of it. Once we've helped them with their schoolwork, and we get and we start them down the path to understand the importance of education, and then a lot of them, to be honest with you, they don't think they they, they don't. It's not even a in their family and in their mind, it's not even a possibility. Right. So it's so far off the radar that they don't even think about it. But when all of a sudden you take them on a tour to UF or Santa Fe or, or t up to Tallahassee or any of the places that we go, and they walk around the campus and they see other kids that look just like them right. and come from similar backgrounds and circumstances, and all of a sudden it clicks, hey, maybe I can go here. Mm -hmm. So with you know with a little bit of help and a little bit of pushing and some conversations with the family, it's amazing how things change. And some of our you know those, some of our biggest success stories started out with kids that you wouldn't they would have never even considered it two years ago. And it sounds like you've got great tracking information on all these people. Uh, I would love to dig into your reports at some point and see those success stories. Now, the the mentor center, I mean that fits right in with this, and I know you got community foundation funding for that and uh, the Cade Family right. Foundation funding. Tell me about that. Um, that came up, that was kind of a, a, a strange way to start, but it was, there was a group of people and in, in primarily the Cades who were interested in creating a, a center that could house um, maybe a variety of different agencies and get them to work together instead of everybody trying to, you know, constantly work on their own. And mm -hmm. um, they also wanted, there, there were some issues with for example, background screening, which was because of some of the changes in the laws, had become a real problem for some agencies. They weren't able to do it. Not having a physical location, there was a lot of different challenges. So we discussed, um, we had a meeting with the Cades and, and um, we talked about, and I had a center that was really underutilized. And I said, we've got, especially part of it that, that we could use to off offer you for office space. Mm -hmm. But this is our, you know, this is our vision of what this could be. Now our staff and myself, I can help you with certain things that's easy for us, like the background screening piece. We have access to training that I know everybody could benefit from because you don't have that national tie that we have. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of how it started and it, it just started to grow. And w the last meeting we had, um, you know, Ms. Mary Cade was there, um, Phoebe's mother, and she said, you know, really simply, she. But she just said, I don't understand why we can't just get some kids and help them, help them with their schoolwork and help them succeed. And I said, that's exactly what I want to <laughs> do. That's exactly what I want to do. And I want to help other agencies be able to do that as well so we can reach even more kids. Right. So that we started off small. We wanted to make sure that we kept it simple and we were able to really control and show what we were doing. And mm -hmm. this is now we're going into our second year. We've got six other partners in the center help doing similar things. Um, for example, we, Youth Build is in, is in the center and doing construction projects in there in the gym, um, which is really cool. Right. And so there's, there's, there's quite a few other agencies working out of there, tutoring or, or some church groups. And we even had Zumba classes this summer. So it's, a, it's become quite a center. You know, we're, we're almost out of time, and I can't believe uh, how much more there is I'd like to talk about. Uh, tell me about your special events. That you have coming in, I wanted to make sure we got that in. Um, we do quite a few every year. It's we, you know, it's part of our fundraising drive. So we do the the one that we have coming up soon is in February, and that's the Will Muschamp Scramble, yeah. which is actually a split between us, uh, Girls Place, and um, Children's Home Society. Oh, nice. And then we have one of our alumni, Doug Johnson, has done what has become our largest fundraiser, which is Reeling for Kids. It's a it's a deep sea deep sea fishing tournament in Steenhatchee. Oh, that's nice. in June. Right. And then our the one that most people are familiar with is our gala, um, which is in August. And then we ha we also just finished our annual bike ride, which has become one of the largest bike rides in, in Florida. We had about almost 450 riders this year participate in that. I, I know you've had some big news with your facilities. 
mm -hmm. uh, some renovations. Tell, tell me about that. Yeah, we're really excited. Uh, our Northwest facility is the oldest oldest facility and his it has not been renovated and if you looked at it you you I could show you we've calculated one time how many times we thought our front door had been opened and closed over the years um, but basically it just kind of been uh, it was never really meant to be what it is it was really ha almost like a locker room type storage facility okay. um, and we converted it and carved out and made classrooms out of it but we've got a waiting list of kids we need more space so we applied for the rotary wall game feast grant this year and we're awarded that funding so we're planning on using that to create some more classroom space and replace those doors that have been opened a couple of million times in their yeah, lives. Excellent. Um, how many kids do you serve in, in a year? Um, our Last year we served about 3,500 kids throughout Elijah County and that's a, in a variety of different ways right. but um, that's some of them come every single day um, five you know five days a week plus summer and some of them are there primarily during a season for a sports program, for example, like football. Oh, with all your different programs, you're hitting yeah, almost. Yeah, about 3,600 3, this year. That's amazing. Um, you mentioned Florida Tax Watch, mm -hmm. and I don't want to put you on the spot. I don't know if you have all these numbers at your fingertips, but is there a one? Is there a ratio for every dollar spent at a boys' club? You're saving. It depends so on what money. it is, but yeah, I, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but yeah. the, the one that really stands out is the incarceration numbers. Right. Um, it's like $5,000 a year to, and I think the numbers were like 21, 22, but I've heard more recent numbers that are like 25, 26,000 a year to incarcerate a child as opposed to educate a child. Yeah, I've heard $65 a day yeah. for someone to be in prison. I think yeah. it depends on where they are and what programs they're in and so forth, but it, it is astounding the difference. And um, it, you know, I've we do some programming also in detention facilities and and in jail and so forth. And it's just, you know, it's a tragedy. That that's how I got into this work. I mean, I I just saw the the repetitive cycle from father to son, and then I, and I would rearrest the same people over and over and over again. Right. And at some point, you just you've got to do something different. We can't arrest our way out of the problem. Well, thank you so much for the work that you do. Um, what I would really like to do, though, is have you come back so that I can hear all about the Salinas peppers. <laughs> I want to know that story, but thank all you right. for coming. Here. Thank you. Appreciate it. I was tired of my life, and I started drinking to deal with it. So I talked to my best friend. Everything was falling apart. I just couldn't take it anymore. So I talked to my girlfriend. No matter what I did, I was never good enough. So I talked to my coach, and we went to this website. These are examples of mental health issues. There are people out there who care about you. They can help. Just talk to them. Who can you talk to? To find out more, go to whatadifference.org and click on Learn.